Welcome to the course on ethical hacking. Today as part of our lecture, we'll be covering DOS attacks, which is denied of service. We'll be looking at sniffers, session hijacking, and we'll see the countermeasures, how can we protect ourselves against these kind of attacks. Now, uh, since we know that all of these attacks are dangerous tool, if in hands of a skilled hacker or an attacker, who have thorough understanding of these things. So they can take the maximum benefit of it in penetrating the networks. Now stiff sniffers consist of observing communication on the network in either passive or active mode. Uh, with sniffing, uh, you can see all the uh, communication which is taking place on a normal network and a hacker can potentially intercept the sensitive information and can use it against a network or an owner. Now an extension or an upgrade of a sniffer is a session hijack attack in which uh, we can consider that it is more aggressive and more powerful weapon in a hacker's arsenal. Now the session hijacking involves taking over an existing authentication session and using it to monitor and manipulate the traffic and potentially executing remote commands on one or more systems. In the most advanced stages of session hijacking directly attacks the confidentiality, integrity of the information in an organization. Now we'll have to keep one thing in mind that attackers using the technique of sniffing can view or modify the information at it because they have the credentials of the victim and they can access the resources for which the victims are authorized. Uh, now they have the username and password. It's very easy for them to access those services. If we talk about denial of service, they generally involve um, uh, one um, or more target computers seeking to interrupt uh, its functionality or to shut down or deny the legitimate use of the services. If we talk about distributed denial of service, it involves hundreds or even thousands of systems seeking to interrupt the access or target systems or the network. Search large scale attacks are typically accomplished with the aid of botnets or the networks are infected with the systems which are um, controlled by the hackers or they use it for dirty work or any of their intentions. So in this chapter, the uh, key concepts would be network sniffing. What is it? What is session hijacking? We'll be talking about distributed denial of service. And then uh, we'll be talking about uh, both denial of service and distributed denial of service. We'll look at botnets and intern of, uh, internet of things by the end of the chapters. Now the uh, basic stuff that we'll be covering about the learning objectives as far as this chapter is concerned, we'll describe the value of sniffers and list their capabilities. Um, uh, we'll see the purpose of session hijacking attacks and the process of session hijacking, hijacking attacks, how it takes place. Um, then we'll be covering the features of uh, um, denial of service and distribution and uh, distributed denial of service. We'll describe the processes of denial of service attacks and then finally we'll be talking about uh, denial of service attacks themselves. Now or botnets at the end. Now sniffers as we talked about an application or device designed to capture or sniff the network packets and it moves across the network. So it is constantly capturing the information which is there on the network. A technology used to steal or observe the information allows viewing the email passwords or web password, file transfer protocol, credentials, email contents transferred, etc. All that communication which is being communicated through the network by insecure uh, channels, it would be easily uh, captured. Now the protocols that, la um, uh, that lend themselves to easy sniffing are Telnet, Hypertext Transfer Language uh, uh, Protocol, or Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, a Network News Transfer, um, and then Post Office Protocol, File Transfer Protocol, and Internet Message Access Protocol, which we use in Exchange Servers. Now if we talk about Telnet, Telnet is a protocol which provides remote connection to network resources but all Telnet messages are sent unencrypted. It means that any keystrokes or any information, username and password which is transmitted using Telnet can be easily captured by tools like Wireshark etc. Then we have hypertext transfer uh, protocol which we say as HTTP. It's designed to send information in a clear uh, without any protected between the web server and web clients. Again, the communication on HTTP can be uh, can be captured as well. Then we have simple mail transfer protocol commonly used to transfer the emails, etc. SMTP um, SM, uh, is simple 
and efficient but does not include any protection against the sniffing uh, same goes for nntp a communication is sent in a clear text uh, including the passwords and data then we have pop which is post office protocol it's designed to retrieve email from servers but does not include protection against sniffing um, again uh, for ftp protocol designed to send and receive files but lacks in encryption and i am uh, ap which is internet messaging access protocol um, is similar to smtp is function and lack the protection now in order to protect your communication we can change the protocols from ftp to sftp um, they can change the I map port numbers we can even change the pop port numbers and smtp port numbers to make it more secure and to make sure that um, their communication is not easily um, capturable on the network now after that we'll see two different kinds of uh, uh, sniffing which is passive sniffing and active sniffing now sniffers are powerful part of the security professional toolkit because they offer the ability to open the packets that are traveling on the network and to observe the communication that is taking place in those packets. Um, now how the um, sniffer works for example typically it's a computer system that can see the communication that is specifically designed to it or um, uh, it is receiving or sending it to a different party. Uh, a sniffer however can see all communication whether or not they are addressed um, to the listening station or not the capability is made possible so by switching the network card to promiscuous mode now promiscuous mode is a mode that allow the network card to see all traffic that is traveling on the network segment including the traffic that is not specifically addressed to it so it is able to see all communication which is taking place on the network whether it is intended for that workstation or a pc or not now if we see the two kind of sniffings which is passive sniffing and active sniffing and passive sniffing works only when the traffic and the station that uh, do the sniffing are in the same collision domain it means that they should be in the same domain where the person is trying to sniff the uh, the clients and the traffic which is flowing between them it's difficult to detect it takes place as an um, is effective when a hub is present because you know that um, on hub if you'll send a traffic it would go to on all ports regardless of if that port is intended for that kind of communication or not but it would send it to all ports and then anyone can capture the information which is going and transmitted on that that's not the case in a switch it can be done in a very simple way now active sniffing it's a technique for using active sniffing and getting around limitations of switches such as media access control flooding and end res resolution uh, poisoning that we'll be covering uh, soon in detail that how it takes place now as you can see in mac flooding it's a technique by bypassing the switches that overwhelm the switch that the traffic is designed to cause it to fail involves the content addressable memory which we call as cam or lookup tables uh, it seeks to exploit the design effect and oversight in some switches namely is limited amount of memory in that switch mac flooding tools include ether uh, flood smac uh, mac off and um, uh, technetium mac address changer now in the mac flooding uh, you'll have to uh, closely look at the attack which would reveal how it succeeds in the task uh, now as we talked about the switches contain the content addressable memory which is used to build a lookup table this table is then used to track the um, track which mac addresses are present and on which port of the switch the switches cam allows a lookup to be performed so that the switch can get the traffic to the correct port and the host which is it's intended to the lookup table is built by the switch during the normal operation and reside in cam now mac flooding can clog the or overwhelm the switch's cam uh, forcing it to forward uh, or to be in the forwarding mode mac flooding seeks the exploit of the design defect and oversight in some switches namely the limited amount of the memory in the switch an attacker can flood this memory with information in the form of a mac address and fill it up quickly until it cannot hold any more information if this memory fills up some switches will enter in a fail open state which means that when the switch fails it leaves the ports open to avoid network disruption uh, when a switch enters a fail open state the functionality becomes a hub so it's no longer a switch and is vulnerable to passive sniffing 
A Mac flooding attack on the switch network with a vulnerable switch can result in a state in which the traffic uh, that might not otherwise be sniffed now can be sniffed. Of course, uh, you don't get something for nothing. The amount of the traffic introduced in the traffic or in the network can make a sniffing more powerful traffic, um, uh, more powerful to detect the traffic, uh, and it could be even difficult if not used with the proper tools and will send up huge red flag to anyone or anything that may be watching a network uh, for any sort of anomalies. Now, if you look at these tools in detail, uh, the Etherflood is a utility which is included in several popular Linux distributions that focuses on the cybersecurity. Um, SMAC is a spoofing utility available in, um, in different websites you can check and is designed to change the MAC address of the system. SMAC, the, uh, the MAC spoofing utility, and uh, that's the one. Then we are talking about MacOff. MacOff is a tool that is available on several Linux distributions and is designed to function like uh, Wireshark, uh, or we can call it Etherflood, which was the old name of it. Um, then the last one is a tool and it functions like SMAC and uh, that is also uh, it can change the MAC address of the system to one of the users and uh, it helps in launching the MAC flooding attack. Now after that we have our poisoning and in our poisoning a method by bypassing a switch where sniffing is performed uh, on an internet protocol which is version v4. Our poisoning occurs on IPv4 networks. IPv6 networks uh, uh, use neighbor discovery protocol which is NDP. Uses cryptographic to generate uh, um, the addresses that can be validated that the source on the M uh, NDP uh, message is genuine. So there are less chances on IPv6 as compared to IPv4. Now to understand it further, that the uh, the other primary method of bypassing the network segmentation to perform sniffing on IP4 address is ARP, which is uh, Address Resolution Protocol Poisoning. IPv4, uh, IPv6 networks uh, are a bit safe, as uh, we discussed, that uh, they can be uh, safe in any sort of attacks which can happen. The R protocol is defined at the network layer and used to translate the IPv4 addresses to physical or MAC addresses. And then um, it is also used to locate the physical addresses. The requesting host will broadcast the ARP request to the network. The host that has IP4 address is being sought will return um, its corresponding physical address. ARP uh, resolves logical address to the physical address on the interface. Then the ARP packets can be spoofed or custom crafted to redirect the traffic to another system, including the attacker system. ARP poisoning can be used to intercept and redirect the traffic between the two systems on the network. Now since now we have the information about ARP, uh, the, keep the process in mind. It's easy to understand the mechanism of ARP poisoning or IP, ARP spoofing. In ARP poisoning, the attacker sends out bogus ARP request to any requesting device on a switch. Um, it could be a device or a switch. Um, the idea is to force the traffic uh, to a location other than the intended target. So you'll redirect the traffic instead of going to the router to any other machine so that the attacker can um, sniff what is being sent or received on that specific port or to a specific computer. Now we'll see the actual demonstration of it. The attacker sends out a broadcast uh, stating that a given IP4 address that is a router or a gateway maps to their own MAC address. As you can see over here, it's mapping to that. A victim on the network initiates a communication that requires existing uh, the network or subnet, which is there on the regular network. When the traffic is transmitted, the ARP mapping shows that the router's IPv4 address maps to a specific MAC address so the traffic is forwarded to the attacker instead. As you can see, the, um, the uh, traffic has been transmitted over there. Um, to complete the sequence and avoid arousing suspicious, the attacker forwards the traffic to the real destination as it is mentioned in the diagram. 
Now, when we talk about our poisoning, uh, just keep in mind that anyone can download a malicious software used to run our uh, spoofing attacks on the internet or on the network. Attackers can use the bogus ARP messages to redirect the traffic. Denial of service attacks can use this technique. ARP poisoning can be used to intercept or uh, read the data. It can be used to intercept the credentials, username and passwords, and it can be used to alter the data transmission. Uh, further, it can be even used to tap the voice over internet protocol, phone calls, etc. Now, likewise, there are lots of different tools that are used in order to, um, to launch the ARP sniffing or spoofing attacks. Now, let's see there are some tools that we can use in order to uh, launch the uh, ARP attack. First of all, we have ARP spoof. Um, that's a PIP install or proof project, which is used. Uh, uh, the package implements an art spoof for man in the middle for the DOS denial of service attacks, etc. Um, the project to be used and tested on the networks to check the uh, uh, to check the uh, spoofing attacks. Uh, then we have uh, Ettercap, which is also used for the same purpose. You can also find it installed in your Kali Linux. Then we have IP restriction scanner. Um, it's a scanner that was not designed to be a part of scanner, but is a valid source of IP address scanner on the network. Um, then we have uh, uh, Nemesis, which is uh, from GitHub, an open source thing that you can use um, to uh, capture the packets or craft the packets or to inject the packets on the network using a command line interface. Um, so you will find this one also installed as part of the uh, Kali Linux as well. Now these are some of the tools they are very capable in sniffing and uh, quite uh, uh, famous in the market. Wireshark we have used it is the widely uh, and the known um, tool which is used for packet sniffing etc. Uh, then we have TCP dump a well known utility or a command line interface in order to sniff the packets. Uh, wind dump, uh, we have shown it in one of the lab exercises. You can find it over there that how can we do it on Windows also. Then we have OmniPeak, a commercial product that is uh, uh, an evolution of the product originality name as ether, named as e EtherPeak and uh, that was also used for um, the sniffing. Then uh, DNS sniff or uh, DSNF is a suite of uh, products that is used to um, uh, sniff the traffic which is flowing on the network. So here you can see their websites. First of all, Wireshark. You can download it. It's free. You can test it on your computer. Again, it comes in as part of Kali Linux bundle. Then we have OmniPeak Network Protocol Analyzer. It helps you in uh, uh, monitoring as well. Then we have TCP Dump, a tool that you can use in order to uh, do a uh, complete dump on a command line packet analyzer. Um, then we have Wind Dump. Again, there is a complete exercise on it. How can we actually dump the traffic from the network? And the last tool is DSNIFF, which is DNSF, and that is also used for the same purpose. Now we'll see what can be sniffed actually. The countermeasures to defeat the encryption includes encryption. So if we want to defeat any kind of encryption or any kind of sniffing that anyone can do on your network, you'll have to encrypt the traffic. Make sure that the traffic is undecryptable or decipherable uh, to, de uh, um, to the subjects without the decryption key. So in order to read the messages, you must have a decryption key. Static ARP entries configure a device with a media access control address of the devices that may use it uh, to thwart multiple types of attacks. Then we have uh, port security switches can be um, configured to allow only specific MAC addresses to be sent and received on each port. Uh, so by following these things, we can at least defend ourselves against any kind of sniffing attacks. After this, now we have session hijacking. In session hijacking, it occurs when an attacker uses a valid session to gain unauthorized access to a system or information or a service. So if a user is validated, now it would try to take details of that session which is taking place between point A and B so that he can act as man in the middle and would be sending packets from one place to another and the other party would think that it's actually coming from the authentic source. 
targets authentication which uh, typically takes place at the beginning of a session making session hijacking possible after that point it relies on a basic understanding of how messages and their packets flow over the network so anyone who's actually trying to take over the sessions they have complete information um, and understanding of the messages that how the packets are flowing between point a and point b it takes over the communication between the two parties and then it would craft it as they want to do it now we'll see that how it takes place actually in a session hijacking the process is you insert yourself between party a and party b so there are two parties you'll insert yourself in the middle and whenever someone is in the middle of the communication trying to sniff the packets that's always called man in the middle now it would monitor the flow of the packets using the sniffing techniques it would analyze and predict the sequence number of the packets if you have captured the packets as we showed in one of of the lab exercises on Wireshark that you can even see the sequence number of the packet so um, the sequence number flows in a sequence uh, so that the other party can understand the messages uh, now the uh, severe the connection between um, or it can even take the uh, connection in between the two parties it can seize the control of the session like it would totally disconnect the point a and would act as he is the point a um, and communicating to point b and it can perform the packets injection in the network as well So if I would like to summarize the hijacking process is a process of taking over an already established connection between two parties. Some points to remember about session hijacking would be the TCP session hijacking is in process um, when an attacker seizes control of the existing TCP session between the two systems. Session hijacking takes place after the authentication uh, which takes place and occurs at the beginning of the session once the process has been um, completed. Uh, the session um, can be hijacked and the unauthorized party can access the authenticated resources. Session hijacking relies on the basic understanding of how the messages are going and session hijacking makes the sniffing um, uh, has two forms which is active and passive. Each form of the session um, or the hijacking has advantages and disadvantages on its own. For example, in active session hijacking, active uh, attacker um, are effective and useful to the ac attacker because they allow the attacker to search for and to take over the session at their own will. In active hijacking, the attacker will search for the or will take over the session and then interact with the remaining party as the attacker were and the party that has been disconnected. The attacker assumes that the role of the party that has been displaced. In a passive session hijacking, the attacker locates a hijack a session and um, um, any session of his interest uh, but does not interact with the remaining party or the party B. Instead, the attacker switches to an observation type mode to record or analyze all the traffic which is moving in between point A and point P B. Now, how to identify an active session? Session hijacking builds on sniffing. In active session hijacking, the attacker searches for and takes over the session um, uh, and then interacts with the remaining party as the goal not only to observe the traffic and the session currently inactive on the network, but also taking over the session. For the session hijacking to be successful, the attacker must locate and identify the suitable set, um, session for hijacking. And it sounds simple, but it is difficult to um, uh, find the actual network segments, the switches and the encryption mechanisms in order to decipher it. Now after that we have uh, um, the uh, further details of how can we actually identify if a uh, um, active session is taking place. Uh, the challenges could be um, uh, challenges standing in the way of successful session hijacking including the sequence numbers and the network segments etc. If they can uh, detect it exactly how it is mentioned. Sequence numbers are there for every transmission control protocol. Packets are unique 32 bit numbers embedded into the header that identifies it and how it should be reassembled with the other packets to re regenerate the original message. 
so if a um, if he has crafted a packet it should reassemble itself and reach in the same sequence at as it was intended only then the other party would be able to understand it and would uh, authenticate the actual process that it is not um, a morph pro packet it would be considered as the right packet for any sort of communication network segments when the attacker and the victim are on the same network segment observing the traffic like a basic sniffing and when two or more different network segments are separated by switch or the technique similar to achieve the sniffing is required in that now we'll see some uh, uh, sessions which are between the active and the uh, passive the sequence numbers acts as the uh, sequence number that is 32 bit as we discussed sequence numbers are used to tell either the uh, machine that is the receiving machine that the order of the packet should go in the right sequence an attacker must successfully determine or guess the sequence number to hijack the session now that's a uh, three-way communication or the three-way uh, handshake tcp handshake is also another name of it so if you're trying to communicate from uh, point a to point b um, you'll first send a sin packet in response the point b would respond that yes i'm alive it would be a sin act and then once the uh, response is received point point b now they'll start the actual communication which is called acknowledgement and uh, we start the communication between the two machines like that now um, how to identify an active session uh, the six sequence number prediction is there when the client transmits a sin packet to a server um, the response will be a sin act so a first message sent as sin it would respond back as sin act the client then respond that this sin act with an acknowledgement during the handshake the starting sequence number will be assigned using a random method um, in the operating system that is supported in this function if the sequence number is predictable the attacker can can initiate the connection to the server and legitimate address that can open up a second connection from the forged address and the communication would start from that point now let's look at the tools which are used in order to um, um, seize the control of a session ethercap ml uh, a multi-platform tool that can be performed and in the middle attacks are spoofing and session hijacking then we have burp suite has the ability to observe hijack sessions between the two parties designed for ethernet based networks and works both in the passive and active modes then we have os which is a z attack proxy open source web app scanner uh, it integrates the penetration testing features including the session hijacking now in order to see the tools um, this is the uh, the editor cap which is uh, used for that the other one is burp suite um, so it's saying what can you do you can automate dynamic scan uh, scanning and enhance manual testing etc an excellent tool to be used um, which is a port swagger um, then we have OWASP uh, um, zap which is uh, a z attack proxy the world's most widely used web app scanner uh, free and open source that you can install and check it then we have another tool G which is j hijack which is also used a java hijacking tool for web application sessions etc a simple java fuzzer that can mainly be used for numeric sessions and hijacking for the enumeration etc and then we have firesheep a firefox extension that uh, demonstrates the http session hijacking attacks etc so those were the tools that we use for the session hijacking etc now how can the uh, uh, seizing the control of the session for example they can use uh, further these tools we have already covered it now uh, we'll be talking about uh, thwarting session hijack attacks uh, be proactive and look for signs of an attack um, use the encryption uh, in order to uh, be protected on the network and configure the routers to block the spoof traffic from the outside protected network and use intrusion detection systems to protect your identity online now briefly we will try to understand what is denial of service attack so in denial of service attack intended uh, to prevent services from being delivered so you want to disrupt the services or the attacker would like to disrupt the services on a network and frequently aim to consume the resources that may also involve actual disruption of a service or a server 
Now, it's not limited to network attacks. Main characteristics of DOS attack is denies use of the system or service through the systematic overloading of the resources carried out when attacker fails at other attempts uh, to access the system. So if they cannot access the system, they'll uh, load it with lots of traffic that the services of it would be unavailable to the public. Types of the DOS attacks are consumption of bandwidth, consumption of resources, and exploitation of the programming defects that we'll be covering shortly. Now, in a DOS attack, uh, it works by trying up valuable resources that could be uh, used for service, uh, for example, legitimate needs of the uh, user. A DOS attack functions like, uh, uh, imagine someone is calling your mobile phone over and over again. At some point, the person might call often um, at the time when uh, no one would call you, um, nor would uh, you call out someone. At that uh, point, uh, you would become the victim of a DOS attack. Um, it translates the scenario into the world of computer networks and you can have a situation in which availability of the services is similarly threatened. So let's see consumption of bandwidth. What happens in that? Uh, bandwidth exhaustion um, is in effect when the network bandwidth flowing to and from the machine is consumed to the point of exhaustion. Means that it would overwhelm the bandwidth of the computer with so much bogus packets that it won't be able to distinguish between the good and bad packets and it would halt the operations. Well-known forms of the DOS attack is SMURF, for example, by exploiting the internet, ICMP, uh, Internet Control Message Protocol, and spoofed packets to the broadcast address of the network, the attacker can generate a torrent of traffic from the number of systems that may reply. So it would use those computers using the ICMP command, it would overwhelm the resources or the bandwidth of the PC. Then we have Fraggle, which is similar to Smurf attack, but bandwidth is consumed through the use of UDP protocol, not TCP protocol. Then we have Chargen, originally designed for testing and evaluation purposes, but it can be used to perform the DOS attacks and generally um, it's gathering the traffic rapidly over the network. After that, we have uh, consumption of denial of resources, um, which is common forms of uh, a consumption attack. Uh, Synflood, for example, uses forged packets with Synflag set. ICMP attack, like uh, Smurf uh, attack, large amount of traffic is redirected to broadcast address of the network instead of a specific system. So it would just flood the network with the packets. Uh, ping flood sends large number of ping packets to the system with the intent of overwhelming the resources of the victim. Um, now teardrop attack, attacker manipulates the IP packet fragmentation, means into pieces, in a way that would crash or would cause the system to crash and the victim would retry to reassemble the fragments and it would fail in that, um, leading it to a uh, teardrop attack. Then we have reflected attacks which uh, attack the spoofs or forges the source address to the packets or requests and send them to numerous systems that responds to the requests. Now after that we have exploitation of programming defects. Now in this kind of attack, the DOS attack may exploit the known weakness in a system's design. Maybe a programming defect, maybe it's not done in a proper way, maybe they had certain things in the coding for testing purposes, but they are being exploited now. Common methods of exploiting a programming defect would be ping of death, um, which uh, relies upon the inability of some systems to handle oversized packets. Uh, teardrop exploits the weakness in a way um, uh, packets are processed by systems, sends packets to a malformed state with their own um, offset or the, vac um, or the values adjusted so that the overlap, which is legal, um, it would tear it down, increase its size, decrease its size, um, um, have it in the fragmentations. Systems crashes or lock up because they don't know how to deal with these kind of packets. Now, land is a packet uh, and are used to uh, for the victim system with the same source and destination address and ports causing the system to crash or lock up. Uh, we have used uh, it in one of the labs. You can find the video of it on our channel as well. Now we'll see some of the tools which are used uh, uh, for that purpose, like uh, we have uh, hping3, a simple command line utility. Again, a video of it is available on our channel. 
then we have low orbit uh, ion cannon uh, which is also easy to use launch uh, to launch dos attacks uh, works on udp tcp and http we have hulk uh, which allows the attacker to launch dos attacks and rudy which is rudy easy to use http uh, dos tool that uses http post method in order to have the dos attacks now, just like uh, denial of service attacks, we have distributed denial of service attacks. And uh, distributed denial of service is a powerful attack method. Uh, for those who know how to use it, uh, security professionals have developed techniques to prevent these attacks, but the hackers keep developing new methods to um, carry out these attacks. Um, now, they use hundreds and thousands of systems to conduct this attack and have primary and secondary victims. Attack can be difficult and impossible to track back to the sources because most of the time they are using proxies or fake addresses through which they are launching the attack. So you cannot detect that actually the traffic is coming from which source. Um, defense is difficult and impact is higher than the DOS attack due to the number of attackers because they are use bots in order to magnify the um, attack vector. Even the effects of attack are increased over those of a standard DOS attack because many of those hosts are involved multiplying the attack and to strengthen their power of a distributed attack. Now, before going to the tools of distributed denial of service attack, we'll understand the uh, the characteristics of uh, a ddos attack uh, it involves uh, or it can be uh, used uh, by compromising a machine on the network um, and the uh, and the way it is more effective is that it is actually commits a dos attack than simply using one of the machines to attack another uh, and now the uh, some of the specifics that you must know about a distributed denial of services that attacks of this type use hundreds of computers as we covered already the rapid growth of internet of things uh, connected devices uh, many of which are not hardened makes the distributed denial of service potentially more dangerous because they are using those devices to launch the attacks now distributed denial of service have two types of victims for example the primary and secondary um, the uh, um, the former is the target of the attack and the latter are the systems used to launch those attacks distributed denial of service attacks can be very difficult if um, if not impossible to track but it's true um, that the source of it cannot be detected easily uh, defense is extremely difficult because of the number of the attacker sources uh, configuring the router or firewall to block a small number of single ip addresses is very simple but it becomes very difficult to block all those addresses which are coming from different sources on your firewall and you don't want to block the traffic which is coming from a specific country as well uh, the effects of this attacks are increased over those of the standard uh, dos attack because many of the hosts are involved multiplying the strength and the power of it now, in a normal distributed denial of service, we uh, divide it into two waves, just to say. The first wave would be the attack is uh, staged and the targets uh, that we act as the foot soldiers are infected with some software that will be used to attack the ultimate victim. Targets are the infections in this phase include the systems that have high speed connections poorly defended and home or business networks and their devices are poorly patched systems etc. Many poorly configured IoT, de IoT devices becomes victims of this phase. Now IoT devices may be low power devices but they are readily available and potential victims for the number um, uh, for the number in millions which are available these days uh, what is uh, infecting these systems can uh, vary but uh, could include software programs such as which are used for traditional dos attacks the second wave of the attack uh, which is the uh, bigger attack which uh, will use the foot soldiers um, from the army to the system that would collectively attack a designated target now these infected systems that we call zombies can um, be in numbers of thousands and hundreds and even millions um, uh, with the waiting of the instructions of their master so as soon as they'll receive the instruction from the master they'll start targeting a specific network for any sort of attack 
Now tools used for that is low orbit ion cannon, high orbit ion cannon, and then slow race. Are you ready um, or dead, uh, Rudy? Then we have DDoSIM, layer 7 DDoS attack, and DVRT. So you can install and check these softwares if you want to, uh, to test it in your secure environment that how actually it takes place. Now again, if we'll uh, see DDoS attacks, uh, it sounds very simple, but it takes some time, planning, and knowledge uh, in order to launch the DDoS attack, uh, not to mention the good amount of practice. And uh, two components are needed uh, for the setup, a software component and a hardware component. Uh, on the software side, uh, two items are needed to make the attack happen. Uh, first of all, um, the client side software, the software ultimately will be used to send command and control request to launch an attack to the target. Um, the second one is a daemon software. The software is a resident on the infected system and devices or uh, bots. The software is installed on the victim PC and waits for the instructions for the attacker. If you have a software of this type installed, um, you are the actual, uh, you are the one who will be actually attacking the other systems. On the hardware side of the system and devices, that would be the components of the attack. Uh, the first one would be the master or the control system, the system responsible for sending out the initial messages to start the attack. Um, they are also the systems on which the client software is present and installed. Then we have zombie, the uh, computer or a device carrying out the attack against the victim. Um, the number of the zombies can vary widely. Then we have target the system, uh, that is the actual victim victim or the recipient of the attack. So let's now see the uh, bots and uh, Internet of Things. Bots consist of computers and devices that are infected with software such as those used in DDoS attacks. As we just covered, it can stretch across the globe and the attacks performed by botnets, DDoS sending, uh, stealing and information clicking fraud, etc. Um, then we are talking about uh, Internet of Things, devices, appliances, vehicles and other objects that have network communication, hardware, software that allow them to connect to the internet. To explain it in a better way, an advantage, uh, um, an advanced type of an attack uh, uh, mechanism is uh, a botnet which consists of computer and devices that are infected with software that are used for DDoS attacks. When enough of these systems are infected to uh, reach a critical mass, um, they can be activated simultaneously to do a tremendous damage to any network. Botnets can stretch from one side of the globe to another and can be used to attack a system or to carry out a number of tasks. Um, uh, in the past few years, we have seen quite a number of attacks using the botnets. Um, as IoT grows, so will be the number of potential of the bots and the future attacks. Botnets can perform several types of attacks, for example, DDoS attacks. Um, they can construct uh, and make sense as an attack method based on the ways of the DDoS uh, works and the number of the systems that can be infected with that. Um, it is even used for sending. The botnets have been used to transmit spam over the network. Network. They are even used to steal the information um, uh, about to the unsuspecting user systems and click fraud with the help of which if someone would click, they would end up losing the information and the uh, become a victim of a future distributed denial of service attack. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the chapter. And in this chapter, we have covered network sniffing, session sniffing, denial of service um, attacks, and distributed denial of service attacks. And we even understood that how botnets and Internet of Things are used in order to increase the magnitude of distributed denial of service attacks. That's it for today. Thank you very much.